Thank you so much for, for the inter, uh, in, uh, invitation. This, this has really been an, a beautiful workshop so far, and I'm really excited about this session as well um, with uh, Susan and Etienne. So um, I, will, uh, I will speak a bit about the brain simulation, but I think so given this uh, workshop and, and the audience, I thought to focus a bit really on the imaging part, um, not so much you know, on the neurology part, but I will show one main example uh, study that we, how we applied this. And your introduction, Max, was perfect for my talk because it really just uh, already mentioned all the problems we have um, in this type of work, which I think applies to everybody taking part in this workshop as well. So it's really about space and resolution. So um, we printed these uh, 3D models to show people how small things are. You can't see it as much in the picture, but if you hold them in your hand, the targets we use in DBS and the brain simulation are centimeter long at best or and, and even thinner and the electrodes if you have them in your hand they're really small so the you know if if we want to use imaging to 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 study that we need um a lot of resolution and and um precision so every step as opposed to maybe fmri or so needs to be as precisely done as possible you know each each single step and once we have a good reconstruction of where the electrodes are, we can then ask questions. But if you know that is not precise, we, we, you know, we can ask the questions, but we won't get the answers. So I would say, you know, maybe the first two years I did this, my results weren't good and useful. You know, it was really a learning curve. So um, and that makes it so special somehow uh, to work a lot with the subcortex and with these small nuclei. To facilitate that and you know add our code or make our code public, we, we um, created the LeadBS toolbox where you can then you know use pre and post operative imaging data to localize electrodes, simulate them, either then simulate connections from them and so on and analyze their placement. Basically, in a model defined space, right? You can look at it in patient space, but also in you know some sort of relative to some template of a nucleus. So. Um, I'm really excited that not only have we gotten some users of the toolbox, but also other labs have joined in and everybody's invited. So this is an open source toolbox. So if this seems interesting to you, reach out to us. We, we really look for helping hands. It's, it's growing and um, you know, we need more people that help us. But already it's been amazing to see the support in the community. And I wanted to mention that uh, very early supporters were actually Max and Birte and the lab because um, the very first atlas we were able to include, which is shown here, is the ATAC atlas developed by Max and um, or first spearheaded by Max. And we were really, back at the time, the project was really small. It was, you know, one man show um, with my PI, Andrea Kuhn. And um, we were really honored to be able to, to include that. And it's amazing to see that the, the group of um, Birte has keep kept up that work and has, you know, is now coming up with ever more detailed um, atlases. And so we haven't yet uh, gotten a chance to include if we even allowed to this, this atlas, uh, the new one, but uh, we, we definitely have to. So it's, it, it seems really amazing. And the whole data set, as mentioned as well by Pilou, um, is really cool for the field. We've also worked with Malar, who is also was a speaker in, um, in, in this uh, workshop. And he basically allowed us to use a very amazing histological data set of the subcortex that he used in his PhD. And one thing that's really cool about it is that it comes in different nomenclatures, you know, in Schaltenbrand, Barron, uh, and Jones and um, other nomenclatures. So it's even sort of Rosetta Stone for the thalamus where you can look at, you know, this structure it could be called that or that. And that, that is included um, uh, inside of uh, LeadGBS as well. And we, we basically also, you know, it is based on histology in some regions like the thalamus, but then we use, for example, diffusion tractography to subparcelate the STN and GPI. So, you know, we try to uh, use sources of information as appropriate um, as possible. And um, it also has, you know, these simulation, um, electric field simulation models with, again, a lot of work by others and um, automatic electrode reconstructions developed in Luxembourg. And um, then these electrodes get ever more complicated so they can even be rotated. So we can also detect the rotation of that. I think that's not as important in this context, but 
you can use it for DBS uh, reconstructions. And also what, what is also really interesting, I think um, SEG um, reconstructions with you know, cases with multiple leads in the brain that could then also be used to validate connectom uh, connectomics. But again, going back to the problems, we have small targets, as Max already said, he, he basically said everything I, I'm gonna say here as well. So, you know, old drawing by Otto Marburg, um, one centimeter long, as I said, roughly, or, you know, 0.9 or something as the SDN is, it's small and it has a lot of complex stuff around it, right? So um, complicated anatomy, this is my brain scanned at the Martino Center in Boston. This is fortunately not my brain, it's a histology slide. Um, we see the comp system beautifully. This is um, actually from Eduardo Alio. I, I mentioned his, his name a few times more later on. And um, so, you know, these things could matter. So they, I, I still don't exactly know what the comp is. It seems to have something to do with the SDN and the GPI and both have something to do with outcomes in, in Parkinson's and in dystonia. So, you know, maybe these structures even matter. So it's good to see them in the images. So I'm totally in support of the um, you know, forced manian uh, idea that we should use 7T more in DBS. Now, the third problem is that millimeters really matter, of course, right? So we can see here three electrodes. This is, let's say, this is the optimal target. There's debate about that, but we use that in this uh, study. Um, it's from a meter analysis by Kerr et al. in 2013. And, you know, just distance to that spot between these two cases where the, the red is the active contact is two millimeters between them, roughly, and that uh, makes or breaks it. So, so this case close to it has an 80% improvement. This case, 51, has a 25% improvement in the motor symptoms, right? So just the distance to the spot by two millimeters can make or break it. So, you know, that combined complex anatomy, small uh, structures, but millimeters matter is really a problem. And it's not so much in fMRI, maybe, at least in some usual normal studies, you know, two millimeters are a voxel, nobody cares about them, we care, care about these big blobs. So a lot of the methods were developed for that over the last 20 years. Um, so for the subcortex, we need to rethink some, some things, I think. So summary, small targets, complicated targets, millimeters matter. Potential solutions already said as well by Max um, is really high resolution imaging, post-mortem data, histology, other sources of information. And one example that I really love to work with or had the honor to work with was uh, done in at the Martino Center. Um, you may have seen it. It's a 100 micron whole brain resolution scan that was also scanned over a whole weekend, um, built a custom co coil by Larry Wald and so on. So amazing data set just uh, structurally. Um, my job was then to fit that to the MNI brain as precisely as possible, which gets increasingly complicated and manual, I would say, in, in these types of data sets, because if you really want it to fit, right, if the millimeters matter, you know, especially in these regions, it should be very precise. But here you can see it, this is now, you know, using such a high resolution resource with patient data. And that may seem totally dangerous, to do, right? Because it's not that patient and so on. So why are you doing that, right? And I, I agree with uh, everyone, but on the other hand, we want reference atlases. And I think there's a lot of value in these. We just have to make them fit as, as best possible. And to that end, I, I was so happy to uh, be able to recruit Simon Oxenford, who has developed this amazing tool called Warp Drive. It's a bit like a Photoshop for the brain and you can, you know, just manually make things fit. So it works on a warp uh, field level, right? So as you can see the warp field here, this is the normalized brain plus the MNI brain. And now let's see um, the STN region that uh, interests us most. We can switch to the T2, so we see it, we can zoom in, it's in 3D slicer. And we see the atlas here and we see the normalized patient brain. Could be even better to see it if we had seven Tesla. But now we can you know, use this tool to precisely make the registration fit in that region. And I think that tool could really be interesting for a lot of people here in the workshop also to you know, register histology to MRI or to register high resolution data to um, MNI space and so on. 
Uh, it will be um, open source, of course, but we, you can also already have it. Just reach out to us. And um, and and the idea here really is not to you know make a whole brain fit, but rather a very focused fit. You can also draw on it. You can see that in I think the next video. So this is yet another one: normal patient data, atlas data, and we can you know smudge the GPE to make it fit. And if our model is focused on that, that might be helpful. You can also use it for histology. So for example, this is a whole brain histological data set from Eduardo Alio in Sao Paulo, a beautiful data set, similar to big brain, a um, bit less resolution maybe, um, but has some advantages as well. And here you see the drawing part of the tool, right? We can see this doesn't fit to the atlas. So we draw a line here and then it snaps it into space, right? So we can, Anna can, can, could use it with her uh, graphic board and then um, make things fit. So, so it can, can be really helpful, I think. Now with that, you know, once we're really sure that for the regions that interest us, the fit is perfect, I think it's safe to then um, augment patient specific data with histology, right? Like the big brain or like, you know, tracked atlases, like the distal atlas from, from a large data. And um, to then basically create scenes that are, you know, both patient specific in a way, but also augmented um, by atlases, as we've done in the past with books, but now in, in the computer. And that now translates also to connectomic deep brain simulation. Um, so in that, uh, the, the main idea, I would say, of course, is to use resting state from Ryan diffusion MRI to some degree to then look at connectivity from these electrodes. And many people have talked about this. I don't have to introduce what it really does, I think, right? So it's about really brain activity and diffusion, water diffusion, both are very indirect measures. And, you know, from a physicist point of view, these are really elegant methods, right? We would, it's, it's amazing. We can look at the brain from outside without opening the skull. We can look at the activity and connectivity, amazing. But anatomists would say, these are pretty terrible methods, right? They don't represent the tracts. You know, you can, it, some, some that may be a bit useful, but not really more confusing than useful. And then if you, if you're like me, a physician, um, and you know what you're doing in, some, in most of the things, they are really just not useful for the job. fMRI hasn't made it to the clinical practice. So there's a reason for that, right? So, so there's not good test, retest re reliability and so on and so forth. So when talking about connectomic DBS, I would say, you know, we did some work with that, but this is not the only source of information. And one idea could be to then use at least, you know, a thousand brains to get some sort of average map that we've done for um, fMRI data based on Randy Buckner's um, GSP data set. We also have a thousand brains averaged uh, structural connectivity from, from the HCP then of course you lose all the patient specificity, right? So that's also not good, but you know, maybe at least it's reliable. It's, you know, it's a set, a set uh, connectome. Other options then would be to use histology, right? Again, Eduardo Alio doing beautiful work here um, with a method he calls histological mesh tractography, where he basically manually delineates tracts and then, um, you know, just simulates particles uh, and water like diffusion uh, in these tubes to, to get streamlines and you know has has created I think beautiful sets of tracts that are again more atlases of course not patient specific but could be helpful um, then another option would be just to use diffusion MRI but to manually curate data sets right anatomists could sit down a bit similar to, to what you've shown Max um, and to say, you know, there's a waypoint here, there's a waypoint here, we know that we want, you know, a set of tract. This is by Eric Middlebrooks from Mayo Clinic, also inside DTBS as an atlas. And then you've mentioned this before, Max, as well. This is, this is an amazing project um, by uh, the McIntyre lab. This is Cameron McIntyre, this is Susan Haber, this is, I think, um, Yolande Smith, and this is probably Peter Strick. So three anatomists, there was also Martin Perron involved. Experts got together discuss tracts. That's how I pictured. I wasn't there. It, it's, but it's, I'm a big fan of that work. You know, they, they were able to look at the things together to turn it and so on to modify it. I'm, I'm sure Susan will also talk about this in a second. And out came one 
amazing data set for this type of work where we can say there are no false positive connections in there, right? So that's really cool. And also there are these small tracts that you simply cannot resolve with tractography, or at least it's really hard to get them. So problem downside here then on the other hand could be that there are more false negatives because some tracts are just not defined. You know, there's so many, so, and they, there's not enough time probably to do all of them, but, but um, at least the ones we see are true, which is amazing. And we didn't have that before. Other options then to use polarized light imaging. Again, um, uh, amazing talk by Carla Miller before. So, uh, you know, this, this basically shows us the pallidum, right? Striatum pallidum, external pallidum, internal subdivided into two parts. It's in, in, in a vervet monkey um, from, from the um, Ulich group. And, you know, these are, for example, Wilson's pencils. You see, see those. You see the striatopallidofugal system. You see the COM system, the STN. And, you know, all these things seem to matter, I think, right? You see some rewiring to, between striatum and GPE. You see rewiring then going to the GPI, and you have these terminal fields of the pallidal neurons and so on, receptive fields. I mean, so a lot of detail here that could matter which I think is important. And as a side note, if you look at the U, U uh, net in the brain from machine learning, this is probably where we are, right? It's a, so it's a compression system coming from the cortex, striatum, then to the pallidum, STN, back to the thalamus and back to the cortex, right? So you, you contract information and you, you expand it again. And that's what the basal ganglia seem to do. So, so, you know, these things seem to matter. And if we want to have good models, we have to map them. Now, that against MRI, right? We've talked about this similar figure as well that Max had. And you know, this is 100 microns. So this is the best we, you know, uh, we can do in post-mortem. So you can't see anything, right? And I mean, this is macaque. So it's, it's, it would be slightly less worse in, 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 in humans, but still, um, you know, this is a really good diffusion MRI in vivo scan. And you have just like one pixel here. So, you know, there's, yeah, just maybe um, um, maybe that as a word of caution when I'm showing you the results um, that I'm going to show. And I guess the, the solution here is really to use multiple sources of information and combine them. So we probably want the individualized, perfect data set in the end that's unreachable, that has no false negatives, no false positives. And if we use individual DMRI data, we have a lot of false positives. We have poor resolution. It's very individual though, right? And then we have normative, maybe the most detailed data, um, primate tracer studies that we can still not really fit to our patient that easily, right? Now with Cameron's track, Atlas, we can to some degree, this is that one. Um, so we can deform these tract atlases. But I guess the take home here is really to use a set of different sources of information, including even books and everything, you know, and um, to then draw our conclusions. So let's try that. I'll go back to <laughs> MRI for now, but I'll come back to the other methods as well. So, so the idea now is to use the reconstructions of the electrodes and to have a stimulation volume um, in here that we can model based on biophysical models. Um, and then we, we look at the connectome or a tract atlas or whatever we have or how we define our anatomy and we look isolate the tracts that go through it and we want to look you know compare top responding patients versus poor responding patients to you know to look at that um the idea is to do that uh we can you know localize the electrodes and then isolate the tracts um we can use a normative connectome but also other sources of information as said and then we can, for example, create a fingerprint, you know, we can project the tracts to um, the cortex and or to other regions of the brain and say, you know, how are they connected? Now, if we repeat that for multiple patients, in this case it would be three, we have three fingerprints and we could then correlate voxel wise, doesn't make sense if only three patients, but with 50 patients or so it would make sense. We can correlate each pixel and the connectivity strength to that with clinical outcomes. And we would find, you know, this is a good spot to be connected to, but if you're connected to that spot, it's, it's not, not good, right? So then um, patients get worse. So that idea of the optimal connectivity profile, you know, you should be connected to that one, not to that one. Then we could use that and 
you know, predict new patients. These are not the same three as here, but you know, these are now different patients from a second cohort. We get their fingerprints again. We can correlate spatially how similar they are to the optimal connectivity profile. And we could then, you know, test whether that yields to, you know, um, significant predictions of the outcomes. We've done that um, in a few studies now. I, I'll show one very briefly um, where we looked at um, depression after SDNDBS and Parkinson's disease. As you can see, on average, patients did not get um, worse or better, but a lot of them had a steep trajectory, you know, getting either worse or, or, um, or up. And we, we were fortunate to collaborate with Phil Mosley in Queensland and Haida Dasari, and then had a Berlin cohort as well. And um, it was really remarkable, it was only structural connectivity here, but that, you know, we found a specific connectivity profile that was really associated with post-DBS depression in Parkinson's, right? So if the electrode was connected to these blue prefrontal areas on the left hemisphere, patients got worse. And that was, you know, we could, we could learn the, the map based on Berlin and predict Queensland and, and then learn it based on Queensland that's here and then predict Berlin. And then there was a final cohort, test cohort from Cologne, which was also significant, not shown here. So, and remarkably that was really left hemispheric um, only, right? So exactly if the electrode were connected to the spots that we use TMS for, for depression, um, I mean, exactly is, is, is an overstatement. So it's, it's, it's not as precise, but you know, it overlaps that, you know, connectivity to the prefrontal left region led to depression. That, that was really um, interesting to us. Now, switching to the last study I'm going to show um, to OCD, where it's more interesting even because um, in your psychiatric diseases, um, and uh, again, Max has even uh, highlighted that stuff as well, we, we, we have um, not yet converged on an optimal target. Right, where, where we want to stimulate. There are um, things like the medial forebrain bundle very close to the SDN, the, the target, I mean, then um, the ALIC uh, and the ventral striatum and so on. So um, we thought, and, and you know, in, in movement disorders, we already have a set sweet spot. It's in the SDN, it's in the dorsolateral SDN. We, we, you know, we, we know that, but in OCD, it's still even, even inside of these targets, we don't yet know where to um, stimulate. And we use then a slightly different method called fiber filtering, where we do the same as I've shown you before on a voxel level, now on a tract level. So for each tract, we um, calculate a statistic, um, T statistic or correlation statistic to um, identify the ones that are associated with good outcome. And we have a tool for that, all open source and in, in, in ETBS. And basically, we were very fortunate to collaborate with the Cologne group with 22 patients in the ALIC, so in the internal capsule, and 14 from, from Grenoble in the SDN. And um, if you just look at the connectivity from these targets to the rest of the brain, shown in green here, it's quite different. But if you tag the, tra the tracks that are associated with optimal clinical outcome, you would then get the same bundle here shown in red in both targets. So if you just compare the red ones, they are quite similar. And we were really excited of that, about that, of course. Indeed, we could you know, learn the track based on the ALIC data. You know, we can calculate it only based on that and then put the volumes of tissue activated, so the stimulation volumes of the SDN cohort on top of that tract and predict their outcomes. You know, so it's really a cross-target prediction of um, clinical outcomes here also works the other way around. We, we learn the track based on the SDN cohort, only the red track really matters here. And then the, the VTAs are really much bigger in the ALIC data set. Most of them were below the track. Um, and uh, again, that, that correlated quite well with clinical outcomes. So we thought, okay, what about other targets? We have, you know, we have the ALIC and we have the SDN, um, but we went through the literature and looked at where would the, the other OCD targets fall into the normal brain. And if you overlay that with our tract, they seem to really cluster around the tract. And in fact, if you measure then the distance between these targets and the tract, that would correlate, it's a small n, but correlate with the reported outcomes of these studies. So, you know, that the closer the studies implemented, 
the targets, the, the better um, the improvement was in these studies. We thought that's not enough. Uh, we <laughs> talked to friends in London and Madrid and um, were able to augment the data set even more with two additional data sets. And um, you know, now basically defined the track based on both cohorts. You can see again, the red tract seems to really connect the two, even though you know, it's not regression to the mean so that the allic ones are, are way too um, uh, ventral. And then we were able to predict outcomes in the additional two based on that. And that was quite, um, you know, uh, was quite great for us, but we thought, what about false positives? So what I mentioned before, so um, thought about you repeating the same analysis now with Susan Haber's or Cameron McIntyre's pathway activation atlas. And again, the same track emerged and you could, could even see um, again, uh, um, you know, significant correlation, but there are some, you know, caveats. So, so for example, here, the atlas just doesn't have anything. It's not defined. And that maps to basically a prediction gap in the fiber score because some targets, you know, so it, it's not it's not maybe as as fully defined as um, uh, as, as the DTI dataset would be. We have, we published our atlas, the result as an open atlas, and we're really excited about the first replication from Mount Sinai, where they had yet another um, I think ten patients, and could again predict outcomes of these patients um, here um, just by overlaying the simulation volume uh, to that uh, tracked atlas. And by now, in fact, there were four replication studies. Interestingly, the most interesting one was really from Utah, and it's different targets, by the way. It's even bed nucleus of stria term terminalis. And then in Utah, these were even to red syndrome patients, but patients that had, had obsessive compulsive symptoms as comorbid. And, and again, the more they hit this track, these symptoms uh, improved. Now, mechanistically, anatomically, I, I, I hope Susan would go more into this and I, I have to wrap up as well. But um, I, I guess one, one point really is that, you know, the, the MFB that Max also showed is defined somehow uh, by Kuhn and, and, and the group in Freiburg by, you know, seeding from the VTA and going to the internal capsule. So, um, and, and our target is basically defined very similarly, but rather, we think it's rather from the STN and maybe rather limbic hyperdrive pathway. And that, that is something Max also showed. So, so um, we, can, we can see uh, this is the MFB as defined by the Liebrand uh, uh, study. This is our track that we defined first. So it's really the same one, but we gave it a completely different label. And so when people read the studies, they think they, they disagree, but in fact, they do agree. It's really the same thing, right? And um, if you look at anatomical atlases, the MFB is just not in the internal capsule. And um, Susan has a recent paper in Biopsych also elaborating on that. The MFB is a, is a, is a different target, you know, a different track going trans-hypothalamically. And even the Kern group recently admitted that. So, so basically, you know, up here is, is not the MFB, uh, neither of the atlases. That is just a part of the, the ALIC. And so taking all that together, if you, if you know, fix the nomenclature, all these studies really seem to agree. And they all seem to point to a region that Susan's work would, would say is really connected to the ACC or VLPFC. We still don't know, you know which one maybe, but based on quite a large N now, if you take all these studies together and say, you know, this might really be the sweet spot for um, stimulation in OCD. So yeah, you can now um, even fit that in with lesion studies. You know, we know that that uh, lesioning this region helps, lesioning this region helps, stimulating these two regions helps, um, TMS to this region seems to help. So it really, you know, the whole thing seems to, to fit. So, you know, we, we, we now somehow converge to call it some, something like the central ALIC target or central ALIC track that seems to be um, connected to DACC and um, STN also seems to have some, some link to the MD thalamus. Interim summary, and I'll stop here. Um, I, I think, again, connectomics could be used to refine neuromodulation targets. They are useful to draw inferences across different targets. So we can really you know, train one connectomic model on one target to predict the other one. And the similar conclusions for needs here 
I think we really need a lot of high resolution connectomes. I was very excited to see that Carla Miller's group is going to push put put out this this resource, you know, where we can create a seven Tesla normative connectome based on that. Um, I think we need to use more and more postmortem data histology, then use techniques like warp drive to to you know refine fit between atlases and patient data. With that, I would stop, I think, roughly in time and uh, take all your questions, I believe. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andreas, for a great talk. Uh